All right. Good day, mates. <laughs> Anyways, uh, anyway, know what this is a picture of? Any ideas? It's a kind of a leery picture. What's that? It's uh, it's back from the dark ages. That is, that is during the plague, the hazmat that uh, that they wore, the doctors wore to keep them from getting infected by the plague. Um, they put all kinds of smoke around them and all that stuff. But uh, anyways, how do we have, <laughs> what's, what's a good reason for being righteous? You know, let's turn to Daniel uh, 4.22. You know, my God is the way maker. You know, he's the light in the darkness. And you know, today we're going to continue in the seventh year of Babylon in captivity. You know, who would have thought Ezekiel would be so full of, of messages, relevant messages? You know, I really expected to be done and back in Daniel at this time, looking at the future, looking at, oh man, the cosmic, everything coming together and, and the rapture and, 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 and the tribulation by this time. But we're in Ezekiel. In, uh, in 16th chapter last week, in Ezekiel 17, is about this great vine that gets uprooted. It withers and dies. But, but, there's a little, little sprig at the top that God takes and he, and he plants it on the top of a mountain and it flourishes. You know, I, I believe, you know, even Daniel might have read up on this when the, when the king had that dream about that, uh, that big tree. And Daniel says, oh man, I wish that tree was about someone else than you uh, because the tree was cut down. Except for instead of a sprig taken from the top of the tree, a stump was left. And in Daniel 4, 22, it says, You, O king, are that tree. You've become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. You, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like wild animals until seven times pass by for him. You know, the, the, the stump was, was saved here instead of the sprig. And I, and I think we, we, can, we can transfer that. Let's, let's turn to Ezekiel 17, 23. You know, we read another parallel passage to that this morning out of John 15 about, about the vine. We're going through the vine in, in Buccaneers. That's our, that's our, that's our verse um, and the verses that we have for Buccaneers. But, you know, Jesus, he's the new sprig. He's saved from the tree. And he's planted on the mountain and, he, and, and I believe is watered with his own blood. What about us? You know, sometimes we need pruned right down to the stump or the nub. To be grafted in tighter to the true vine so that we could bear much fruit again. You know, we go through seasons. I mean, sometimes we're, you know, being fruitful, sometimes we're not. But we go through seasons. There's a lot that can go wrong. We can get to sucking all the energy from the vine and become joy suckers instead of joy givers. We can become riddled with worry rather than become peace bearers. God's got this. We can become quick to anger, to drop anger instead of hanging in there with patience to the ripening of God's timing. We can, we can let hate sever relationships rather than forgive and connect with love. The blossom can wither because of doubt and never let faith fully pollinate it to produce faithfulness. We, we can let selfishness worm its way in and never see goodness or kindness given as a pure, authentic fruit. I mean, I, I, love, I love the picture of, of us being the branch and, and Jesus being the vine and, and the father being the husbandman or the gardener. And Jesus is the true vine who brings the curse of the dead tree to life. You know, with all that can go wrong, with all that does go wrong, we have a way maker. God can make all things right. 
righteous. In Ezekiel 17, 23, on the mountain heights in Israel, of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the field will know that I, the Lord, will bring down the tall tree and make a low, the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will do it. Let's, let's turn to Ezekiel 18.5. You know, there, there was a dead tree. And I, I'm thinking the law. Okay? The law. We've, we've come to the law. It, the Bible says, the Bible says that, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's because of the law. The law made, made sin sin in Romans. You know, this dead tree, this law, this cross with the sole purpose of taking life was planted on a hill by Jerusalem, on a mountain. The very source of life was hung on that dead tree. You know, Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single fruit. It remains a single seed. You know, that dead tree was watered with the water and blood that flowed from Jesus' side. The Father gardened that vine to life and made it flourish. And then, we as believers became the branches grafted in the true vine by grace through faith. And the miracle of spiritual fruit began to blossom. Waymaker, miracle worker, light in the darkness. You know, the, the Buccaneer verses that come from John 15 this year, we're, we're, we're trying to instill them to bear much fruit. And grow, grow, grow so that they can give, give, give. You know, we got a catchy song that, that we've been singing every week. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. Good things will align. You know, he is the vine. We are the branches. Oh, never mind. Uh, but, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're grafted into this vine. Are we producing fruit? Or are we being suckers? You know, God continues to draw these Israelites to an individual level. I mean, he looks at them as a, as a big thing. You know, here, here you are. Here's the big tree. Here's the big scene of things. But then he chops off this little sprig. And he says, this is Jesus. I believe this is Jesus. And he's replanted. But he talks about all of us as individuals too. What is the purpose of being righteous? These Israelites had roughly two years to respond to Ezekiel's prophecies. There was going to be a sifting through the city. And after the sword, the famine, the wild beasts, and the plague made their rounds, the survivors were the ones not pruned from the vine. Because they were the righteous one. They were not cut from the vine. Back in chapter 9, Verses 4 through 6, an angel put a mark on the foreheads of the ones that did the, not to kill with the plague. Mark of the foreheads for the, for the ones that, that were sorrowful for the condition of Israel. They were known by a mark. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit. The seal of the Spirit should be recognizable. In Ezekiel 18, we're going, verse 5, it says, Suppose there's a righteous man who does what is just and right. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look at the idols of the house of the Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife or lie with a woman during her period. He does not oppress anyone, but returns what he took in pledge for a loan. He does not commit robbery, but gives his food to the hungry and provides clothing for the naked. He does not lend at usury or take excessive interest. He, with, he withholds his hand from doing wrong and judges fairly between man and man. He follows my decrees and faithfully keeps my laws. That man is righteous. He will surely live, declares the sovereign Lord. You know, this is, this is what happened to the city. Okay, back in, in Ezekiel 14, if you'll turn back to Ezekiel 14, 22. This is what happened to the city. God went through this city and he said, 
And he picked the righteous ones out. He sifted through them. You know, he did this mark thing on the foreheads, you know, with the plague and everything. But, but they went through. They went through famine. They went through the sword. They went through the plague. They went through wild animals. And, and, and this is the forecast in Ezekiel 14, 22. It says, yet there will be some survivors. Sons and daughters who will be brought out of it. They will come to you. And when you see their conduct and their actions... You will be consoled regarding the disaster I have brought upon Jerusalem. Every disaster I have brought upon it. You will be consoled when you see their conduct and their actions. For you will know that I have done nothing in it without cause, declares the Sovereign Lord. Please, let's turn forward to Ezekiel 18, 20. You know, this is, this is what happened then. Israel was pruned. But even as these exiles went into captivity nine years after the first group... They're bearing fruit. There's a difference. Where just two years earlier, Ezekiel is hanging God's disaster of sword, famine, and wild beasts plague over their heads. How does it work today? You know, there's a strong connection, and, and, and I don't want us to miss it. I, I planted a peach tree behind the parsonage about uh, eight years ago. And uh, out of eight years... I've had three years that it's produced fruit. Last year, last year I got one peach out of it. One peach. The purpose of that tree is to produce fruit, right? I pruned it last year, and, and really, really the big problem with that tree is the climate. I mean, <laughs> what... You, you get the you get the you get the the blossoms on there, and then all of a sudden, you know, the 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 fruit is just starting to starting to you know it's pollinated and everything, and then all of a sudden, psh, a freeze just knocks everything out, you know. And if I really wanted fruit, you know, I'd 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 cover it with plastic or maybe put some kind of a smudge pot by it if I really wanted it. But you know, we can we can be like peach trees planted on the plains of Colorado. You know, the, the climate is a, is a lot like Jerusalem during Ezekiel's time. You know, we get excited about the blossoms, you know, oh, it looks so pretty and the foliage and everything like that. But, but the environment freezes off the blossom and, and, and even before it can grow into a peach. You know, I don't know if uh, this will turn out to be a good allegory or not, but, but the, I have an apple tree back there and I don't ever remember planting it. Uh, but, but a few years back, I noticed, I wa walked by there, and there was apples on this tree. And I was like, whoa! It was just, there was a good amount of apples. I never even saw it blossom. But there was some fruit on that tree. And I put that fruit in my smoothie and stuff like that. And, and then, you know, uh, the last few years, I've, I've started pruning it and stuff like that. Every year, that thing brings nice apples. And it isn't, the apples don't have worms in them either. You know, a lot of apples in, in this area will have worms in them. They don't have worms in them. The birds like to eat them and, and, and chew on them before I get them sometimes. But, but the, the apple tree. So, so, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking, okay, the point is to either be a different fruit and move away from this harsher environment. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking you know, the internet, the TV, the bar, or, or even wealth is freezing the blossom. It, cut it out. Move from that environment. If the eye offends you, cut it out. It's better to go to heaven with one eye, right? Than to hell with two. What is stimulating fruitfulness? What is drawing us up? And I think, I think we gotta, gotta really make an assessment. You know, let's, let's go out into our orchard. Let's, let's look at our branches. Are we bearing much fruit? Because if we're not bearing much fruit, we're not connected to the vine. Or we're sucking everything out for our own personal experience. The point is, the purpose for our lives is to produce fruit in keeping with God's word. Jesus says, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. You, 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 you can't avoid it. We just got to figure out where we're supposed to be planted. 
and how to prune ourselves. In Ezekiel 18, 20, it says, The soul who sins is the one who will die. The son will not share in the guilt of the father, nor will the father share in the guilt of the son. The righteous of the righteous man will be credited to him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against him. But if the wicked man turns away from all the sins he has committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, he will surely live. He will not die. None of the offenses he has committed will be remembered against him because of the righteous things he has done. He will live. Do I take pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, I am not pleased. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent! Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Please, let's, let's turn back to Ezekiel 16, 62. You know, why be righteous? Why bear fruit? Because that's life. In it, that's life. You know, we, we can save ourselves from God's disappointment, his judgments. I, I remember messing up as a kid. And uh, the disappointments that, that I felt from my peers and, and my, my parents was always greater than the discipline. You know, there, 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 there's a part of me that, that wanted whatever... The, the punishment inflicted on me. I wanted that to be strong enough to, to, to spank the guilt right out of me. And I wanted that disappointment gone. People naturally want to make things right by themselves. It doesn't work. You know, the Catholic Church ha has penances, you know. You can, you can crawl upstairs, you can say your Hail Marys, you know, and, 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 and do all things. And not only that, you know, because generally that doesn't work. That doesn't free the guilt. So, so, so because it doesn't free the guilt, there's going to be another great time you can spend in purgatory and pay for your sins. And then all that guilt will be washed away. You won't realize it on this earth. That's way that, but it doesn't work. Nothing we do in this life or other life can pay for our sins. And the Bible makes that clear. We talked about atonement last week. Atonement is found in Ezekiel six times. In Ezekiel 16, 62, starting with 62. So I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord. Then I will make atonement for you, for all you have done. You will remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth because of your humiliation, declares the sovereign Lord. The only way for that guilt to be washed away is for, is for his atonement. Even in this Old Testament, you know, we talk about the law and everything, the sacrifices and everything. They could not free themselves from guilt because of anything they did. They couldn't just be righteous. Okay, I'm righteous now. Even that we read that, but, the, but it brings it full center and says it has to be, there has to be an atonement made. That, that sprig that's planted on that mountain had to die and pay for our sins. Let's turn to, to, to keep your place here and turn to Romans 3.22. You know, the, the next place in the Bible where atonement is found is, is, is in Romans 3.22, but, but I'm, I want to talk about that shame, your humiliation, that, that, that guilt that, that, that doesn't go away. And I want to say it's a good thing. Um, I, I got a verse up there out of 1 Corinthians. Um, it's on the slide. <laughs> and uh, 2 Corinthians. Yet I know now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance 
For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed any way by us. And, 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 and so there's, there's a purpose for that shame. There's a purpose for it. Not for us to dwell in it, not for us to say, hey, this is, this is my role in life. I made those mistakes, but so that we could come to Jesus for this atonement. And in uh, Romans 3, 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. I remember that, that verse, is God not just? Is God not just? Is it not you that are just? We're justified. And I love the, the, the way that justification is. Justification is just as if I had never sinned. That's what it means to be justified. Just as if I had never sinned. You are justified. Doesn't that feel good? When God looks at us, he paid the price. Just as if I had never sinned, I can come before him. We come to him in shame. And this is what he does to us. We're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. There's that atonement, that word of atonement. Through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins beforehand, committed beforehand, unpunished. Is God not just? He is. And the justice fell on Jesus. In verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It's excluded. On what principle? On that observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Let's, let's turn back to Ezekiel 18. And we're going to start with verse 30. You know, sorrow. That sorrow. That, 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 that we come before God and we go, whoa. That guilt. You know, it was, it was good to come clean with you a couple of weeks back and my wife and God about my transgressions, my, let's just call it what is, sin. You know, it was like a burden lifted and a fog cleared. You know, the confession wasn't what made it so. You know, there was a part of me that, that wanted you guys all to line up and spit in my face. And, and, and slap me. There's a part of me. I was, I was sick to my stomach to, 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 to let you all know, hey, this is what I did. And I believe that was, that was what I needed to do. But God made atonement. You know, Jesus was born out of this mess in Israel. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, you know, the whole tree was torn to the ground. Israel, but a, a sprig saved. And the reason for Israel was, was to bring in Christ. And the reason for Christ is, it was, was so we could be cut off of our own selves and be joined together with him. To be planted with him in his death. He did what we couldn't. He, he observed the law. He was perfect. And then he took what we couldn't. He took all our guilt. He took all our sins upon himself. And he was spit on in his face. He was slapped. They pulled the hairs of his beard out. He was whipped, mocked, crucified, cursed, killed, and buried. You know, my guilt, your guilt, was laid on him. 
And it was enough. Nothing we could have done would have ever been enough. But his, what he did was enough. You know, and that's all cool to have the burden lifted. But he didn't just do it because of pity. He didn't just do it, oh man, I don't want these guys to go to hell. He did it because you and I were worth it. Because one day, we would bear much fruit. And just like I planted that peach tree out there to get some peaches off there, uh, sometimes they're surprising, you know, the apple trees kind of, what I imagine is, is, is kind of like the, the Gentiles grafted in, you know, because the, the, because the Jews rejected Christ and, and now the Gentiles are grafted in and, and a surprise, we're bearing fruit. We're worthy. You're worth it. We were worth the pain, death, and hell Jesus went through because as new creations in Christ, we will produce much fruit. You know, as a believer, I was buried with him in baptism. And in Ezekiel 8, 30, we're going to look at this. It says, turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all the offenses you've committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. You're worth it. Live like you're worth it. Let's pray. Lord God, I just come to you and, and I look at the seasons of life and, and how we, we go from this to that. And then we feel sometimes we, you know, just, just like, just like the, the, the fall, we wither, our leaves fall off. And, and Lord, you just, you just keep bringing us back. Lord, help us to remember the purpose which we were created, to give you glory. Lord, help us not to, not to feel we're worthless, but to really see our worth. Your, your price on that cross was a high price. You went out and, 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 and discovered or created us, but, but you went out and sought us out like a, like a pearl of great price. And then you went out and you purchased us because we were worth it. Lord, may we live up to what you thought about us when you made those sacrifices. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.